Good afternoon, and welcome to our presentation on Tough Conversations. Um, this is a presentation by the Collaboratory for Aging Resources and Education, otherwise known as CARE, which is a lab within the Center for Public Service and Community Resources. Uh, this lab is co-directed by Dr. Angie Goins of our social work department. Hi, Dr. Goins. And by Tammy Mermelstein, JD MSW. Um, did I, am I saying that right, MSW? Yes, MSW, I thought I was missing an initial. Uh, and Tammy Mermelstein, MSW, and JD. And they will, uh, we, we did this presentation recently for alumni and also for students and uh, both groups uh, have, we've gotten a lot of good feedback saying the information presented was just very, very informative and, and uh, they were able to ask a lot of questions that they couldn't get answered elsewhere. So I hope you enjoy the, uh, the presentation. I will turn it over to Dr. Goins. Good afternoon, faculty and staff. Thank you so much for tuning in this afternoon uh, for our uh, presentation. So we're gonna share our screen. Um, today you're watching a webinar uh, that talks about co tough conversations about aging, what you should know before you need to know. And when I was thinking about how to introduce this all, uh, or introduce this topic to you all, um, this topic was actually inspired uh, to Tammy and I from the many conversations we've had with older adults, family caregivers, uh, older uh, children, uh, adult children of older adults have come to us and have talked to us over the years about you know, some of the tougher conversations that they have with their loved ones. And so we decided, why don't we kind of put together you know, a PowerPoint that, that focuses on all of those conversations that are really hard for us uh, to talk about with our loved ones who, who may be older adults. And so that's kind of how this was born and originated out of. As Stephen said, um, we we're able to do this workshop and the webinars that, that we've done previously under the uh, umbrella of the collaboratory uh, for aging resources and education or care. And so uh, we provide connection, consultation, training, research, and advocacy uh, for older adults. We promote issues impacting things that are important to them, whether it be policy issues, uh, information that'll help them with healthy aging, um, you know, giving information to the next generation of students who may be going into the workforce who may encounter an older adult and just giving them training and, and providing service learning opportunities for them to build their, their skills. And as Stephen said, CARE is a part of the Center for Public Service and Community Research under the College of Public Service. So thank you so much for being here today. This is one of, of my favorite quotes. and. Um, while Dr. Goins mentioned our professional experience, we also both have been or are caregivers ourselves. Uh, Rosalind Carter said this, and what she said was, there are four types of people. Those who have been caregivers, those who are caregivers, those who will be caregivers, and those who will need caregiving. And um, as Dr. Goins said, part of our impetus for this is that the topics that we're, we're going to talk about today are ones that people really struggle with. And we're hoping that we can make things a little bit easier. So this brings us to our, fir our first poll question. We wanna hear from you. Um, so if, if you could please load the poll question. Okay, is that something that I'm supposed to do? I'm sorry. Is the poll the audience, the audience can answer the poll. Can they see the poll? Yes. Okay. And what are the results of our poll? Well, actually right now no one's voted. So I don't know if the audience can see the poll. If you're unable to, to complete the poll, if you wouldn't mind in the, in the Q&A box, let us know what brings you here today. The votes are coming in right now. Oh, okay. perfect. Okay. 
please only answer one question at a time. Yes, if you could just answer question one right now. Thank you. So, so far we have five out of 16 people answering. I'll wait just a few more seconds. Okay, um, five people responded to the question and the uh, top uh, choice was helping out an older loved one uh, that got three votes versus serving as the primary caregiver for an older loved one that one person selected that, one person selected seeking general information and two people selected seeking general information for myself. That's great and, and thank you for that feedback. It, it helps us to, to know a little bit about um, what you're hoping to get out of today so that we can make sure to meet those needs. Okay. So one of the things that, that we've learned when it comes to aging is that unfortunate, unfortunately, a lot of what we do is reactive. Um, it may be that somebody has a health crisis and all of a sudden the family is struggling to figure out what do we do now? Where do we go? Who do we even ask for help? And um, when that happens, it can really make a, a stressful situation even more stressful, um, especially if, if you've never reached out to certain types of organizations or, or professionals before. And so through this presentation, we're, we're trying to help people be a little more proactive, thinking about some of these topics before they become crisis points for you or for your family. And here's our second poll. Okay, and I am seeing quest I am seeing comments in the Q&A about people not being able to submit an answer to the poll. So let's try this again. And again, if you would remember just to answer that the question number 2. I don't see it on the screen though. You don't see the poll on the screen? No. Quentin or Ma, uh, or uh, Tisha, are you there? Yes, I have it shared right now. Okay, okay. I'm in polling right now. Okay. So if y'all can answer question two, how would you rate your level of comfort about talking to an older adult, a loved one, about moving from his or her home? And you can scroll down to see the choices, I think. Yes. I think there's something wrong with the poll because we're, no one again is voting. So okay. why, don't we, why don't we just ask the questions? Okay. Or how, how, you wanna- so, um, so how would you rate your level of comfort about talking to an older adult loved one? If you can put it in the chat box, how comfortable you feel? Very comfortable, moderately comfortable, not comfortable at all. We have uh, Noreen says she is comfortable. Uh, Mary Jo says she's done this already and it was a very difficult conversation over many years. Um, we have uh, one person said that um, she's not very comfortable. Carlos says he's not very comfortable. Um, yeah, Mary Jo, we know the chat is disabled, only Q&A. You can put your, your comments, your chat comments in the Q&A and I'll respond to them. Monica said moderately comfortable. Thank you, Monica. And so as we as we look at these topics today, we also wanted to, to give this caveat. Um, these are these are topics that um, Dr. Gowens and I have found through our, our personal and professional experiences to be relevant. But but please remember, there is no one size fits all for aging. Um, these are suggestions. And if you would like to talk with us about a particular situation, we're, we're happy to talk with you after this presentation. 
And here's the start of our top 10. For each of the top 10, we start off with a quote, something that, that we have heard people say in the past. I told my mom she should, she'll just have to move in with me. And here are the facts. Almost all older adults want to age in place and age in community. So, so the suggestion of moving for many people is, is a very uncomfortable one. But in that conversation or in, in this idea of aging in place, 42% of older adults fear being a burden to loved ones. Um, it's often why people don't ask for help, even if they need it, because they're, uh, they're afraid of, of damaging relationships with other people by asking for that assistance. But when it comes to, um, comes to higher levels of care and the idea of, oh, we'll just put someone in a nursing home, more older adults fear being put into a nursing home and what that would entail for their life than they actually do dying. Even though most older adults want to age in place, for many of them, it's, it's quite complicated or um, there could be many barriers. For example, one in three older adults in Texas have some type of a disability that can impact their ability to care for themselves on a daily basis, maybe impacting their ability to cook for themselves or clean or, or bathe or, or things like that. And for a lot of older adults, they may need modifications to the home, such as ramps for a walker or extra railings or, or um, handrails in the bathroom. And uh, those things cost money. And for many older adults, they may not have the funds to make the modifications to their home to make it more livable. So if you need to talk about the possibility of moving with somebody, um, first thing to know is that there may be in-home supports available. Um, they, they do cost, but it is less expensive to look at in-home options than it is to look at something like a nursing home. And many people don't know of the options that can bring services into the home that may be able to help their loved one age in place. Listening is also really important. Um, we, we did this presentation once and someone basically said, well, why don't I can just tell my mom or I tell my dad where to go? And it doesn't quite work that way. Um, as we'll talk about later, older adults have the ability to make choices for themselves. And so listening to the concerns and, and really getting to the heart of it can make that conversation easier. And if you do need to move somebody, especially if you're moving somebody into your home, try to take as many steps as possible to preserve whatever level of independence that person has. So if that person can still, for example, cook, um, talking with them about whether they want to take meal night on for, you know, once or twice a week or um, what that person can do to decorate, design their space and, and really make it, feel, um, make it feel like home for them. So for example, I had a, a loved one that was living in our home that um, had it started to show some signs of cognitive decline and she lived in the kitchen. She loved cooking and baking. And after an, an incident where um, we had to stop her from putting a, a plastic cutting tray into the oven because she forgot she couldn't do that. We, for example, gave her a special tray in a different color than every other tray. And that was her tray to cook things on in the oven. And that way she always knew that she had something that was safe. Dr. Goins? Yes. So I teach an aging elective here in the social work program. And one of the first things that I ask my students is, where do older adults live? And the answers that I receive are all over the place. Um, we started this uh, particular conversation by talking about dad is all alone. I'll just move him into a nursing home. And I saw someone mentioned about putting a loved one in a nursing home that you're very fearful of doing that as you should be, as anybody should be putting their loved one anywhere where you're not familiar or, or, or know for, for certain if they're gonna be cared for. Um, you know, I uh, made that decision early on when my father developed Alzheimer's that I was going to make sure that he was kept at home. Now that took a lot, it, you know, it took a lot of personal sacrifice on my part and those of my family members, but we made it happen for him. But not every family can do that. So I wanna give you an idea of how many people, you know, uh, what, where do older adults live? Most of the students that I talk to in class, they automatically think everybody lives in a nursing home. And I'm like, really? Uh, so as we can see, only 2% of older adults live in nursing homes. The majority of them live in the community, in their homes. 
in their families' homes, um, maybe in personal care homes in the community that are in residential areas. They may live, um, they may live in uh, apartments uh, for seniors. Um, and as you can see here, when we talk about long-term care or where individuals li live, there's this continuing level of care. So we start out in the community, like I said, they're in their homes, they're in apartments, they're in the community. Then they may need more care with like toileting and transferring, maybe somebody to cook for them. Um, and they may want to move to a facility that offers a higher level of care. And so they move on to what we call independent living, which has some support, maybe there's a nurse, you know, there 24 hours, or maybe, maybe there's a, some staff on call, uh, but they can pretty much manage uh, for the most part on their own. Then they move into assisted living or moderate support with helps of ADLs, which is activities of daily living. This is where they need help bathing, dressing, grooming. And usually these facilities have like the, the cords in the showers in case they fall or something, they can pull the cord. Uh, these kind of facilities also have grab bars in the bathroom where they can get up and down if there is a bathtub or if they are in the shower. Uh, there's also pulleys in the living room. Let's say they fall in the living room or you know, a push button. Some of these more modern places have push buttons where they can push a button and it'll let somebody in the building know that they have fallen and then staff will come and help and assist them. But again, with every level of care, it costs a little bit more because it involves more attention from another individual who is usually paid to take care of them in those type of environments. Then, um, you know, as we age, we we either decline physically, not everybody, just depending on, on, on genetics and, and lifestyle choices. Uh, some people will decline mentally and physically or cognitively as well, and they require more help. They may have, they may break their hip and they need some rehabilitation and they go into a rehab facility. And from there, they either go back home or they go on maybe into a, a, an assisted living or nursing home facility. Uh, and usually at this stage, they, they involve some kind of medical um, treatment or help. They need help with their medications and that kind of thing. Then the highest level of care that a lot of older adults will move into is skilled nursing facilities. And if their memory is impacted, the memory care units where there is high support, uh, lots of help with activities of daily living They make sure they monitor, they give them their medications and all that. Anywhere along this continuing, your loved one may go into hospice care and hospice care it does deal with end of life issues but it's not the end of the world i have seen people graduate from hospice uh, I have seen people be on hospice for a year and a half where the doctor ended up taking them off of it that maybe they ended up in it later uh, but a lot of people hospice will serve for the purpose it was meant for pretty much which is end of life but you know my father died in hospice in his own home and that's just something that he always wanted was to be an old man warm in his bed at home and in my family and I worked together to make sure that his wishes were abided by but that's very hard to do if you're an only child or you don't have a lot of support or um, that kind of thing but um, but I just want y'all to know that it's not just a nursing home that your loved one has to go to. There's lots of resources out there. Like I said, care homes in residential in areas uh, where there's like three or four people that are being cared for by around the clock, 24 hour staff. Excuse me, Dr. Goins, Cynthia Russell has uh, raised her hand. So Cynthia, yes. do, you want, do you want to talk? Hi, Cynthia. Hi, hit my mistake. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Okay, all right. <laughs> okay, thank you. All righty. So how would you discuss about options with your loved ones? First of all, you want to ask that person. You don't want to tell the other person where he or she will live. A lot of times, um, adult children, they're so frustrated with their parents because um, you know, they may have to leave their job early to go check on them or they, you know, mom and dad are calling me five times a day because dad fell and mom can't get him up, whatever the case may be. And so um, sometimes adult children will automatically jump to conclusions and go, well, you know, I just need to put them somewhere where they're going to be cared for. But it's important to have that conversation with them before you start making assumptions about their care because they, unless they have been deemed to lack capacity, they make those decisions for themselves. 
So what you would probably start talking to them about is do they feel safe in their home? What's going on that, that doesn't make them feel safe? Has something changed in the environment? Does it take them a longer time to get to the bathroom? Have they fallen several times trying to go to the bathroom by themselves? There's certain things that can be put in place in a home that can reduce uh, you know, injury to an older adult or them hurting themselves. Um, but you, you always want to check with the, that person, you know, what is going on in the environment? What are you concerned? Why? I, I noticed mom, you've been calling me five times a day. And it's like, I do have to work. Is there, you know, it, would it help if we got somebody in here, paid somebody to come in a few hours a day? There's state programs that can pay for that kind of help to kind of be with them during that time. A lot of times older adults are lonely and they get scared when things happen to them when they're by themselves. So you always want to have that conversation with them. And you always want the conversation to be driven by their concerns and not just your fears. Because, you know, we know our parents and we, we, we know what triggers them and they know what triggers us. And so we need to be aware of how they're going to respond or how, how we respond to them uh, and what their concerns are. Uh, we don't ever want them to think we don't care what they think. So that's just very important. Right after Harvey, I worked with older adults um, impacted by the storm. And for me, one of the most memorable interactions I had was um, a, a gentleman who reached out to me. Um, his, his mom had passed shortly before Harvey. His dad was in his 90s, uh, living alone in the home. The home flooded. And so he reached out to me to find out uh, what nursing homes or assisted livings were in the area. And so I met him and his, his dad, and we were talking and we're having this whole conversation. And I, I stopped and I said to him, what does your dad want? And at first he, he looked at me like I you know, was, was talking a different language. And he said, well, I don't know. And so I turned to his dad who had sat there just quietly kind of staring off uh, through this whole conversation. And I said to him, what do you want? And he goes, I just want to be in my home. It was the home that he and his wife had, had lived in for close to 50 years. It was his home. And it, it opened the sun's eyes too, in terms of well, of course, dad would want to go someplace where he's taken care of and doesn't have to do these things. And all his dad wanted to do was, was figure out what he needed to do to, to get back home. Um, we're, we're going to skip the poll question since it's, um, no, the, the poll is, it's, it's abled now. It's, it's okay. abled, enabled. Perfect. True or false, a person in the early stages of dementia still has the right to make decisions for himself or herself. True, false, I have no idea. All right, so most people got it right. Um, eight eight uh, of, of the people that responded said it was, tr that's true. One said it was false and one said, I, oh, three people said, I have no idea. Okay, all right, Tammy. So this is a very tough conversation to have with older adults. Uh, we've heard so often, he's old, he can't make these decisions anymore. I know what's best, okay? There's a very fine line between what you think is best for your loved one and what they think is best for themselves. And it gets really murkier and a little bit more skewed when that person starts developing early dementia or early stages of dementia. For this particular true or false question, the answer is true, because even though they may be developing some memory issues, and even though they may have been diagnosed as having early dementia, that does not mean they lack capacity. That does not mean that they don't have the right to make um, decisions for themselves, whether those decisions are good or bad. Um, and, you know, even the law, Texas state law states um, that the, their protections for older adults, especially elderly individuals, including anyone 60 or over. Um, and they talk about, you know, uh, individuals being able to make those decisions for themselves, unless the person lacks capacity. And the only way we can deem whether someone lacks capacity or not is if they have been diagnosed either or screened by a doctor. And ultimately, legally speaking, uh, a, a judge has to say, that they lack capacity and they need a guardian to care for them. Now, most older adults who have um, 
severe dementia or can't make decisions for themselves or lack capacity as diagnosed by a medical doctor don't ever really go on to have to need a guardian because usually someone uh, comes in at that point and becomes their power of, of medical attorney or their power over their finances, power of attorney over finances. So a lot of people don't ever get to that stage. Um, but it has to be determined by the by medical and by the court. And so um, um, when my father was first diagnosed with dementia, um, I was I asked his doctor, who is a geriatrician trained in geriatric medicine, when, you know, is it too late? to take him to, to do powers of attorney to make sure that when his the dementia does get to the point he can't make decisions for himself that I can take over for him if that's what he wants. And she says, you need to do it soon uh, that at that early stage of his dementia, he could still make decisions for himself. And we went to attorney and he let the attorney know, yes, at, at that point that I'm no longer able to make those decisions, I want my daughter to make financial and medical decisions for me. And I, I held that very sacred because, you know, I was thinking for him, you know, and what he would, would have wanted for himself. So self-determination is a right. And it's, it's, it's very, very important that, that we don't put on to others what we think that they should do. Uh, you know, making poor decisions is not the same as lacking capacity. Unfortunately, I used this example the other day when we presented to the students about a friend of mine whose dad wanted to stay in his home during the winter blitz. Remember, it got really, really cold back in February. And she said, Dad, please, I don't want you to be here. And he was kind of fine line. He had never been diagnosed. He wasn't forgetful. He was 70 something. He was just very stubborn, did not want to leave his home, said, look, I got plenty of blankets. I got this and this and that. And, and she just, she was crying. She didn't want, I mean, he would just, he wouldn't leave. And what ended up happening is she was trying to get a hold of him. I think that when it was out at its coldest and all the power was off, she couldn't get a hold of him. Uh, she ended up going there when the when the roads were open and she found him, he had frozen it to death in his home. And that, and that was very tragic and very hard to hear. Um, but that was his decision to do it. And we see a lot of older adults, especially during disasters that we have here in Houston, whether it be flooding, uh, hurricanes, tornadoes, freezes, um, you know, even the summer heat can, can tell of all older adults and they don't wanna leave their homes. Uh, you know, there's agencies out there that can make their homes, you know, livable by getting them AC units and things like that, or getting them heaters during, during cold clips. But in that particular situation, he pretty much um, chose, you know, he knew what his circumstances, he knew what, what his decision, you know, the possibility, what would happen, because she says she talked to him about that. And he says, yeah, I know if I die, I die in my home. That's what he told her. And that's exactly what happened. So, you know, but for a person where we think there might be some capacity issues, is the person a danger to him or herself? Those are questions that we need to start asking. Do they understand the risk of their choices? And I have met so many individuals who did not understand the risk of their choices. And I had to bring a doctor to their home when I was in protective services and they had to be assess there. And the doctor said, this person like totally lacks capacity. We can't leave them in this environment. And I had to move that person. So I, you know, there's a difference, believe me, between someone who's starting to have dementia and those who are not. Um, and at the end of the day, you know, they may need a guardianship or someone to be over them or get, or at the very least get them screened. And, and if you can get them seen by a geriatric doctor or somebody who's trained in geriatric medicine, that's the best, but any doctor can screen them for capacity. When we discuss this issue with individuals and, and when we talk with family members, you don't wanna confront your loved one. You just wanna look for certain signs. Were they someone who dressed up uh, nice all the time and all of a sudden they don't appear as dapper as they used to be? Maybe they look a little disheveled. Maybe their, their clothes are dirty. Maybe uh, they may not be aware of where they're at, what time it is, uh, certain things like that. So starting to have those conversations slowly with them say, you know, dad, and, and I had this conversation with my dad, actually. I was like, dad, you left the back door open when you took off in your car. Did you know you did that? No. And, and I said, dad, when you put the garbage out, you like dump the garbage bag 
with trash, you just dump the trash into the recycling bin without the bag. Did you know you didn't know? I'd call him at lunch and say, Dad, I left something for you in the microwave to heat up. Did you eat it? Oh, yeah, it was wonderful. Thank you so much. I was so thoughtful of you. I get home at five o'clock. It was still sitting there. So those that those little things just start adding up. And I would just start talking to him about that. Uh, and, and, and he started deteriorating the more his Alzheimer's advanced. Um, so you want to definitely look for signs that that there might be some memory issues and, and, and bring that to their attention instead of, you know, being accusatory or making them feel embarrassed by it. Just, you know, it, it's something that it's kind of happening to both of you. Right. There's someone that you care about and you love them. And, and you know, I'm kind of worried about you. I've noticed you you forgot to take your medications. Have you ever done that before? Has anything changed? So your approach is very important when you're talking to someone. Um, and, and then if, if they're really, if it's really getting bad, um, you, you really need to get them screened medically. You always want to seek doctor's advice and, and see what's going on. They could have something as simple as urinary tract infection that's causing confusion, causing them to be off like their baseline or where they usually are as far as like uh, their behaviors and all that may be off because urinary tract infection is an infection. But once you take an antibiotic for it, it's cleared up. And a lot of times older adults get misdiagnosed for having dementia when they're really having urinary tract infections. So just being aware of that. Is the environment they're living in even unsafe? You know, I know people who want to put their loved ones in nursing homes and their, their loved ones not even in an unsafe situation. They just don't want to have to worry about their mom or dad. I've had people tell me that. Um, and again, I talked about natural disasters and about, you know, a lot of people, I don't think any of us are prepared for natural disasters. We certainly weren't prepared for the winter storm. But again, it had its it had its tragedies to it with all the people that, you know, didn't prepare or didn't have the proper things in their home to keep them safe. All right, we're going to turn to a conversation that makes many people uncomfortable. Um, I want you to take a, a moment and think, what if I were to tell you right now that I had to take away your keys? Take a moment and put it in the chat. How would you react if all of a sudden I said to you, you could not drive anymore? You can put your responses in the Q&A section. <laughs> Carlos says he'd be devastated and Gerardo says, hell no. <laughs> you know, and, and so thinking about your reaction, this is why it becomes such a tough conversation. So among older adults, especially here in Texas, especially here in Houston, where, um, having a car can be extremely necessary, about 90% of older adults think of driving as freedom. And some of the reactions you all are, are putting in the chat echo that. Driving lets us get to where we wanna go when we wanna go. But unfortunately, people tend to outlive their ability to drive by about 10 years. So if we are blessed to live long enough to, to be at that point, at some point, all of us may face that um, that potential of, of not being able to drive. And unfortunately, Houston does not have a lot of resources for, um, for older adults or people with disabilities who can't drive. And it's a, this is a little picture of a map that shows um, highlighted areas of the county where there are services. So if you notice, if you live east of oh, uh, you know, 45 288, there's nothing there. So it, it becomes a real challenge to, to talk to people about the possibility of losing their keys. And, and the quote that I had up there is actually something a student said during a presentation I, I did on, on transportation. Well, why can't she just ask for a ride? Think about what we talked about earlier in terms of people not wanting to be a burden. And you know the answer to that question as well. So research has shown that if you take away someone's transportation options, especially someone who's not used to using public transportation, there's a whole host of negative outcomes to their physical health, to their, to their um, socialization options, to their cognitive health, there's, there's depression. And some studies have even shown it leads to higher mortality rates. And because we all have that thought of, that idea that driving is freedom, it becomes really, really difficult to sit down with somebody and say, I don't think you should be driving anymore. So the first thing is understand those feelings are entirely natural. It is okay to feel that way. 
but at the same time, if you are noticing um, that your loved one may be a danger to to him or herself or to others being behind the wheel, it, it's time for that conversation. So if somebody has significant physical changes, maybe through, let's say, osteoporosis, that person has lost bone density and height and now can barely see above the steering wheel, it may be time to have a conversation. Or if a person is showing signs of, of cognitive decline, um, somebody who is getting lost all the time, that may be time to have a conversation. And um, vision challenges as well. If, if you notice that somebody just can't see what's out there anymore, it's time to have that conversation. So the first thing is try, try to talk with the person and see if they would be willing to give up their keys voluntarily. Again, there's, there's a, a strong likelihood that they won't, but the outcomes are better if you're able to get somebody to be on the same page and do your research. So if you go to your, your loved one and say, all right, it's time to stop driving without a plan, that conversation will, will almost certainly not succeed. Have that plan, look and see what resources are out there. So there are a few transportation options. Um, if you have the, the ability to afford you know, an Uber or Lyft, there's actually with Uber, um, a service that's located here in Houston where you can call and that company will book an Uber for the, the person so that they don't have to worry about an app or credit cards on their phone. But as a last resort, if all of this fails, um, doctors have the ability to file a form with DPS that says this person needs to be reevaluated for driving safety. And then you're not the bad guy. Um, it's the state that comes in and says to the person, you, you can't legally drive. Now, there are some people who, despite that, will, will still probably ignore that and get behind the wheel. And, and that's you know some of the most risky situations. But if you take these steps, it, it may help to, uh, to make the conversation at least a little more palatable. So from one uncomfortable topic to another, from transportation to death. Um, I, I did a presentation once where I asked older adults how many people had funeral plans and about three quarters of the room raised their hands. And I said, well, how many of you have um, power of attorney documents? And almost every hand went down. People, people struggle um, with, with the thought of end of life. And COVID has been especially interesting for that. Um, among older adults, you know, one of the populations most affected by COVID, um, the number of people who have wills has actually gone down um, over the last year. And now about 55, 50 percent of those 55 and older do not have any type of will. And, and many people think it's expensive. Um, but there are resources that can make it um, less expensive, including places in Houston to get free wills. But it's not just about a will. Um, Dr. Goins had mentioned uh, medical power of attorney or financial power of attorney. These are documents um, that you actually can download from the state website and fill them out. Uh, you don't have to have an attorney, but it is recommended. One of the reasons why these conversations become so uncomfortable is because people are asked to choose a person and a backup person to make certain decisions. And so you know, for, for parents, well, if I, if I choose this person, that person will be offended. And so as part of the conversation, um, assure your loved one that there are no hard feelings if one person is chosen over another. It's really about who that person feels uh, is, is most likely to fill their wishes. So in, in my family, I have one sibling who uh, for my father was appointed financial of, of the four of us, she is probably the most financially responsible. Um, I have been appointed for medical power of attorney because my dad and I have had conversations and I'm the one that best knows his wishes for, for what he wants to happen. So it's, it's really about who would be the best person to make that decision. And, and when you have that conversation, frame it in terms of, you know, not let's talk about what to do if something catastrophic happens to you, but, um, you know, in the event something happens, I really want to make sure your wishes are honored. And I would, you know, I would love to know what it is that you want in the event something happens. And um, I unfortunately have been in that situation of, of a loved one having a, a catastrophic event without these documents. And 
Um, I hope none of you have had to be in that situation. It's incredibly tough to, to struggle with, you know, whether or not your actions would be in line with what that person wants. So um, not just for your older loved ones, but for yourself, make sure you have these documents. Um, Dr. Goins mentioned capacity. If these documents are signed while a person has capacity, then these documents survive any lack of capacity. And as I mentioned, um, you can complete these, many of these on your own without an attorney. Dr. Goins? Okay, medications. Um, this is a very tough topic to talk about with older adults. Um, older adults come from a generation where they trust their doctors implicitly. Their doctors can do no wrong. Um, I'm not going to second guess my doctor. He or she knows what's best. But we all know that a second opinion is always better or best um, because sometimes some doctors are not trained in geriatric medicine. And so with that said, they may not know how certain medications are going to interact with an older adult unless they've had specific training. And I've had a geriatrician tell me that, that, um, that they've, they've seen mainstream doctors prescribe medicines that are just totally not appropriate for an older adult. But let's look at the facts before I kind of get into that. Over 54% of older adults take four or plus prescriptions daily. Now that may not sound like a lot to, uh, to your average person, but for an older adult who's already kind of struggling with, you know, um, you know, living on their own, um, dealing with, you know, the stress of being in COVID, being socially isolated and all that, you know, it can be kind of hard to remember to take that many medications. One in four struggle to pay for prescriptions. So it not only can impact them physically if they don't take them right or, or, or take them the way that they're prescribed, they may not even be able to afford them, which you know they go without and that can impact them physically and cognitively in all kinds of ways. One in five don't take medicine properly due to the cost. Uh, you know, Some of them will say, well, you know, these are really expensive, so I'm gonna skip a day. Uh, they're pretty strong, so maybe if I skip every other day, I can afford 30 days worth. Believe me, I know older adults who have that kind of thinking when it comes to taking their medicines because they they're they they're trying to budget their medication, and that can be that can be very um, uh, dangerous sometimes. So the lesser of two evils: should you take the medication or not take the medication? A lot of our seniors have uh, are on fixed incomes and they have to make decisions every month. Some of them may have pensions in social security and that's great. Some of them just may have a pension or some of them just may have social security. But when it comes to the end of the day, medical costs are a part of, of their budget that they have to really kind of uh, uh, to look at. And I've known older adults who will go without taking their medication so that they can pay their light bill or that so that they can pay their grocery bill. Uh, and, I, and I think that's kind of a sad reflection of our society right now that, that we do have older adults who, who are, have low income and have to make these, these really hard decisions. Um, but many older adults do not talk with their doctors about drug cost or available discounts. And there's so many out there right now. Uh, there are some medications that older adults take that can be given for free because the doctor, you know, he works with pharmacology all the time. Uh, different sales reps come through those doors all the time offering special offers. And, and, and sometimes doctors can offer that free to their, their uh, seniors that come in. Um, you know, there's, there's other uh, prescription programs that can help. I know that Walmart has a list of some of the most common uh, medications for like three or four dollars. Uh, I always give that list out. I'm a, I'm a home health um, social worker for a, a home health agency. And I always, I said, would you like a, a list from Walmart? I said, it's got some of the medicines you're already on right now. And I said, you could save a few pennies. Maybe if you really, and I said, yeah, and I'll show them. And I'll show their, their blood pressure, the diabetic medicine. When they see they can get it at Walmart for like $10 less, they jump on that like a June bug. So just helping them try to identify resources out there that can kind of keep the cost of medicines down for them. Sometimes their drugs will interact and counteract very differently with an older adult than they do a younger person or even a mainstream individual, someone like in their 30s, 40s, and 50s. Um, I, a geriatrician friend of mine told me a story about a, an elderly lady, her 
children came to her and said, you know, we, we're so scared. Our mother, she's in a fetal position. You know, her doctor put her on all these medicines. Could you look at her medicines and see when the doc, the geriatrician looked at the list of medicines, she was appalled. They had her on all kinds of stuff that she was over medicated. And they said her mother used to be a concert pianist and she used to play the piano all the time. And then she started taking all these medicines and now she's like in a fetal position and she doesn't want to get out of bed. And, and the doctor was just like, oh my gosh, I can see why. She goes, we need to start weaning her off of some of this. And she told me that within a month, this woman was back to playing her piano and enjoying life and visiting her family just by taking like five or six of those medicines off that a mainstream doctor had prescribed for them. So you really, you know, if, if you can't have your loved one see a geriatrician, at least ask for a geriatric consult through your regular doctor or through a, a regular doctor who's not a geriatrician. Um, so perfect example, that's a perfect example of how physical and cognitive decline could be related to side effects of medications. Most doctors don't have special training in older physiology or pharmacology. Again, I know that in the medical schools, uh, they do offer it, but, you know, a, a lot of times, you know, the training, um, if, unless you're going into geriatrics, the training for individuals who don't want to go into geriatrics um, is very limited. And so it's not as expertise as if you're going to be a geriatric doctor. And that's just the way the medical schools are set up right now. Yeah, you want to encourage your loved ones to ask for medication reviews, uh, you know, say mom, dad, have you, have you had your doctor look at your medicines just to see what might be kind of not working with maybe some of the other medications. Uh, and I mean, that goes for us at our ages, whatever that age may be, you know, we shouldn't just take take it at the doctor's advice. We, we need to we say, you know, this is impacting me this way. It's impacting me this way. Is that normal? Is that, am I supposed to be feeling that way? And I would always recommend going with the older adult to the doctor's office. It's intimidating for any of us to go to the doctor, but that intimidation is a little bit stronger when you're an older adult um, who maybe your vision's starting to be impaired. Maybe you don't hear as well. Uh, you know, sometimes people will think somebody has dementia when they really got, they've got hearing issues. I think that's one of the biggest misconceptions for people who have hearing issues is that they, they somehow lack capacity. Uh, you, they may not be able to hear everything the doctor's saying, but you're hearing it. So there's two of you hearing it. And so y'all can talk about it afterwards. So that's just a recommendation I always tell families when I'm working with them. Um, you want to share all the medication that that person's on. Uh, you know, a lot of older adults, they participate in what we call polypharmacy. They go from pharmacy to pharmacy to pharmacy, and they, they have different medications at different, um, different um, pharmacies, and, and it's all counteracting against them, okay? Ask the doctor about newer, less expensive medicines at each appointment, and it's always good to keep a list of those medications in case of emergency. If you do find your mom or your dad maybe lying on the floor, you'll at least know, you know, what medications they took. Uh, you wanna look at their pill boxes. Did they take their medicines for that day? Did they skip medications? Did they forget to take medicines? Uh, you'll be able to tell that by looking at pill boxes or I started doing the pill box for my dad just to take that burden off of him. And before we go to the next, um, the next piece, if you need any of those um, medication reviews, many of your pharmacies will do it for you for free. Uh, for older adults, you can contact the Area Agency on Aging, and I'll put that number up at the end. And they actually have a program right now where they work with um, pharmacists to do medication reviews for older adults. Time for our next poll. If you're an older adult and need help with cooking, cleaning, or transportation, Medicare will cover it since it's cheaper than moving into a nursing home. Okay, we have, um, we had one person said, of course, isn't that part of the employee taxes I've paid? Uh, two people responded, maybe, and two people responded, of course not. So whatever answer you chose, 
Um, it's certainly understandable why you have chosen that answer. There are a lot of misconceptions when it comes to the Medicare program. Um, many people think that Medicare will, will cover all of these types of things. Um, in truth, for the most part, Medicare does not. So you have Medicare, people enroll in it around the age of, of 65. Um, it used to be that there was one option and now we have what are known as Part C plans or Medicare Advantage plans. And about 40% of older adults participate in, in one of these plans. The, the Medicare Advantage plans, if you're not familiar with it, um, are Medicare plans run by private insurance companies. And, um, and, and whether it's traditional Medi Medicare or the Medicare Advantage plans, they, they both have their, their own pros and cons. Um, and a little known fact, and we bring this up because Houston actually has um, a fairly significant number of older adults who, who move here as older adults and may not qualify for, uh, for Medicare programs. In certain circumstances, you can actually buy into Medicare if you don't otherwise qualify for it. So these are some things Medicare does not cover. They don't cover any type of in-home non-medical care. It doesn't cover nursing homes or long-term care um, with, with a few small caveats. If it's something directly related to a, a medical issue, then there is a little bit of coverage available. Uh, Medicare doesn't cover any type of vision treatment such as uh, glasses, and it doesn't cover hearing aids. It doesn't cover dentures um, or, or almost any other type of tooth care, dental care. Um, and it doesn't cover any kind of home modification. So if you find you need those grab bars, uh, Medicare is not your place to go. Um, I say this, that there's caveats to, to almost all of these. So the, the Medicare Advantage plans have started offering uh, some of these services as a value added benefit to its members. So some of the private uh, Medicare plans do cover, um, at least in some part, some of these things. Um, and then there's one more fun thing to add into this mix of, of complicated plans, which is known as Medigap or Medicare supplement. Um, it's only available if you have traditional Medicare. And what it does is it helps pay for those things that Medicare does not, but it only works if Medicare itself covers it. So if something is not covered by Medicare, the Medigap or Medicare supplement plans don't work either. If you have um, never had the privilege of trying to figure all of this out come open enrollment, which is October to December, uh, consider yourself lucky for the time being. It is extremely complicated looking at the different plans and trying to figure out what really is, is the best option. I mean, think about your hiring paperwork when you, when you look at all the different plans. Um, and there are more choices available for older adults. But there are places that you can turn to for unbiased, um, impartial, uh, free advice, namely through the, the Area Agency on Aging, which I, I mentioned earlier. They have people trained to go through this, um, to go through the information that's also available on the Medicare website to help someone choose a plan. And um, it's really, you know, six of one, half a dozen of the other. They both have their pros and their cons. And so it's, it's really important to look at what, what plan best fits a person's doctor's medications, um, and, and other medical decisions. And we encourage people to keep open minds. So what we tend to see happen is somebody picks a plan and then they just stay with it. And it doesn't matter that half their doctors are no longer on the plan or that their medications aren't covered or it doesn't cover, for instance, mental health services, even though they need them now. Um, keep an open mind. It's, it's a, a literally open market every October. And um, it, it takes some, some research or some connection to have someone do that research for you, but it could honestly save people a lot of money in the long run. Dr. Goins. Yeah. Now this is a very, very hard conversation to have with your loved one who may be experiencing memory issues or um, start experiencing early dementia or dementia or Alzheimer's. Everyone loses their memory as they age. Um, that is not true. Everybody um, ages differently. Everybody's memory is going to be different. There's not a one size fits all. But facts show or statistics show that 14% of older adults who are 71 and older have dementia. 
I was involved with the Alzheimer's webinar a few weeks ago uh, in the Alzheimer's Association. They say that the number one factor, the leading risk factor of someone developing Alzheimer's or, or, or dementia related Alzheimer's is age. So the older we go, you know, the, the longer we live, you know, um, our, our, our brains are going to be impacted by age for different reasons. There's different kinds of dementia. There's not just one dementia. And we'll talk about that in just a little bit here. Uh, a lot of older adults will go undiagnosed or misdiagnosed. Like I mentioned about the urinary, the urinary tract infection instead of, instead of having actual, you know, diagnosis of dementia. Um, you know, some people just think, oh, well, you know, they're just forgetful because they're old. Okay, well, not necessarily. Not, not, there, there may be reasons that, are, that, that someone's memory is, is, going, is getting worse. Uh, but in Texas, we know that we have seen an increase uh, by 23% between 20 and 2025. And 2025 is right around the corner. And just I, to add, I was looking at these numbers yesterday and, and the article that, that had the state breakdown made, um, made a point to say that Texas has and still has one of the smallest populations of older adults percentage wise of, of any state in the country, yet we are going to have one of the biggest increases in Alzheimer's. A lot of people think that dementia is, is, uh, is you know, dementia is not a part of healthy aging. Uh, there's different kinds of dementias. There's uh, Alzheimer's related dementia, which makes up 60 to 80% of all cases of that type of dementia. There's Lewy bodies dementia. Um, if y'all remember the comedian, Robert Williams, he was diagnosed with that. Uh, and that has certain features to it that are different. Um, with uh, there's vascular dementias that are brought on by someone having a, a heart incident or a stroke. Um, and that can impact the brain and your ability to recall and your memory and all of that. Um, and so there's different kinds. There's, there's a, a hypocephalation or NCH where you have swelling on your brain, okay? There's, uh, there's alcohol-related dementia where someone has drunk so much over the years that it impacts their, their brain. I had several clients when I was an adult protective service who had alcohol-related dementia where it just impacted their ability uh, to remember things. Um, but not all memory problems are a sign of dementia. And we talked about that. There might be, you know, reversible conditions such as urinary tract infections or, um, you know, uh, depression can sometimes mimic the signs of dementia. If someone is so depressed, you know, and they don't want to get up, they may not care what day it is or where they're at or what they're doing or who they're with. Depression can really uh, present as if it's dementia when it's just depression. And, and of course, there's resources for that. There's you know, any, any uh, depression medications. But COVID has been affecting individuals who have dementia in a very unique way. You know, you already have a population that's vulnerable because of their dementia, but not having socialization, uh, being isolated has increased the number of individuals who have been presenting with dementia. And so we need to be aware of that, that, you know, isolation can cause an individual to become more forgetful. You know, a lot of senior citizens will go to activity centers and they'll get out and they'll go to church things because they want to be able to keep their memory sharp. You know, they go to these little programs where they can learn to fix their appliances or go line dance or learn how to sew or do, you know, there's, there's different uh, programs in our city that, that are offered for older adults but with COVID they haven't been able to do any of those things so all they all they can do is be at home and watch tv talk to loved ones over the phone uh, and that kind of thing and so that has increased uh, their their level of cognitive and mental decline and also the depression you know you if they already have dementia and they're depressed because they don't have anybody to talk to that's kind of a recipe for even more cognitive issues but this is a very hard conversation to have with an older adult. Think about it. If I came to you today and I said, you know what? I think you have dementia. I think you're forgetful. And I, I, think, I think you're going you're, you're to be a danger to yourself living on your own. How would you respond to me? You probably wouldn't be happy to see me. Okay. Um, so, you know, 
when it comes to remembering things and recalling things, uh, we don't want anybody to question that about it. We take a lot of pride in being able to remember things, right? So when you're talking to someone, just be sensitive to that uh, and be prepared. They're going to get defensive and angry. I remember when I told my dad, dad, your doctor's saying you have dementia. Well, what does that mean? Well, that means that you've got some memory issues and you're going to have to stop doing some things you like to do. Like what? Well, like driving. Oh my gosh. I mean, when he said a lot of curse words when, and he didn't like it. And he went to some major depression when we had to take those keys, but he was driving off and getting lost. And we didn't know where he was at. He could eat. I think he scared himself one day. He didn't even know where he was at. But it is very hard to talk to someone. But, you know, you just have to be sensitive. You always put yourself in that other person's shoes. Uh, you want to start the conversation with certain things that you're noticing. You know, I noticed, you know, you left the back door open. Dad, the last time you went out on that trip, you didn't get back for two hours. I don't know. I was driving around and around. Well, you know, I've also noticed this. I remember my dad took his medications twice in one day. And he was in shock, but he, I think that scared him. But just, it, it always helps if you can, you know, not to embarrass them, but just say, look, I'm starting to see there's some issues here. Uh, and, and one presentation we gave and we were talking on this topic, someone had said, well, why don't, why don't we stop softballing the topic? Just take the keys away or just do this or just, you know, just tell them they can't do this, this or that. Well, that's one approach, but is it the best approach? And, you know, you get more, with honey than a stick. And so just think if someone told you that kind of thing, like, well, just do this or just do that, would you really want to listen to them? So again, I think if you approach your loved one, like we're going through this together and I'm going to help you during this transition that you're going in, you'll probably get more support on their end or you'll get more uh, response from them. But you want to offer your support and stay connected to your loved one, even if that conversation is going to be really tough. And this is one of the tougher ones. All right, we're on the home stretch. Um, I don't want to be a bother. This is a conversation that is not nearly as tough as many of the conversations we've talked about today. But the reason why we include it on the list is because it's a conversation that people tend to overlook, which is the idea of connection. Um, so looking at the flip side of that socialization, uh, the, the lack of socialization, the loneliness and the isolation, um, recent research has shown that the effects of being isolated is deadlier than smoking and that it leads to cognitive and physical declines and ultimately higher health costs. One study estimated that six billion, that's billion with a B, uh, of Medicare costs is related to older adults who are isolated. And whether it's they go to the ER for um, a chance to be around people, whether that's they, um, they put off medical care until absolutely necessary, but just that a lot of costs can be translated to older adults who are lonely. Now, the, the interesting thing is that um, loneliness has all these negative outcomes. Being connected actually has even stronger positive outcomes than the other side has the negative. And so when people are, are connected, they have better physical well-being, better cognitive well-being, higher self-esteem. They can, um, if they face challenges, they have more resilience. And um, the, the really interesting thing is that th these benefits happen no matter what the activity. So whether it's somebody who stays in the workforce, whether it's volunteering, whether it's being a part of church activities, social activities, whatever it is, the, the idea of, of staying connected, that, that piece of staying connected um, can really make a positive impact and frankly in the lives of everybody, but especially for older adults. And and so one of the things it's, it's interesting, um, we see older adults that have, you know, we think someone's older, they wouldn't have these kind of feelings, but that, that nervousness of going to a place for the first time of, um, you know, going where you don't know somebody. And if, if you think, if you think about those statements and you feel a little bit awkward, um, you can understand where, where some other people are, are coming from, especially um, older loved ones. So offer, offer your help, encourage them to go with a friend Oh, hey, I could pick you up and so and so up and, and take you to this activity or, um, you know, who could go with you. Um, but on the flip side, recognize there are some people who really 
just prefer being alone and trying to force them into an activity could actually um, could actually backfire. Make sure that you're maintaining your, your own connection with somebody. So um, for somebody that we've been providing caregiving services for, uh, we, we make it a point to call pretty much every day, even just a, a 10 minute check-in, how's it going, how are you doing, helps that person stay in, in touch with reality, in touch with people, um, and recognize that they're a part of the community. And um, offer to help. So if, if somebody has an interest, hey, you know, can I help you find, you know, a, a group nearby that that engages in this hobby or a book club or, or a movie watching group or, or whatever it is. Um, utilize your technology skills to help someone who may not have the ability to look up those things on um, his or her own. And the last one, and I can't tell you how many times I've heard this. Um, I would, I would interact with somebody who couldn't secure enough food or couldn't pay their utility bills or their house was falling apart. And it's like, well, let's talk about services. And I would hear, I didn't need help before. I'm not about to start now. And it's, it's a challenge. And so it's something to keep in mind with all of these conversations, especially if you're dealing with somebody who, who never really had to ask for help before. It's, it's tough. It is really tough tough to admit that you have a situation that you can't completely control or solve on your own. But also know that if you are working with an, an older loved one, that there are places out there that can help. Um, there are resources such as what we are doing here at UHD with, with CARE, places that you can go to for unbiased information. If you are a caregiver, there are online support groups, uh, chat rooms, and other places, virtual groups happening right now, but there, there are places that you can connect with to get the support that you need because self-care uh, self is, is critical. Um, if you are a caregiver for a loved one, you are at increased of a host of adverse health conditions because it is ex extremely easy to say, this person needs me. I can't take time off because I'm doing X, Y, Z for my loved one and people who are caregivers will frequently neglect their own health. And unfortunately, um, some give, caregivers pay the ultimate price for that. And um, then their loved one who still needs care is left without that support. Here are a couple of, of uh, phone numbers and places that we've mentioned in the presentation. The Harris County Area Agency on Aging um, is federally funded to provide some resources and support. Um, Adult Protective Services can assist in cases of um, abuse, neglect, and exploitation. And then there's us. So um, we started this project um, officially in October. We've been working on it unofficially since about 2019. Um, this is our email address. You can always reach out to us. We, we monitor the email and, and either Dr. Goins or myself will respond to any questions or concerns that you have. Um, these are our, our direct phone numbers right now where, where you can reach us if you prefer phone over email. And here's, here are some other ways that we can help and support you all and the UHD community. So we offer personal consultations. If you have your own um, situation that you would like some, some advice on or just to explore what resources are out there for whatever situation you might be facing, we can certainly set up some one-on-one -on -one times. Um, we're also offering support to, the, to UHD faculty. If aging is something that will touch everybody, uh, whether you go into a field where you're, you're looking at aging or, or not, aging is a part of everything we do. And, and especially with the, the latest numbers released by the U.S. Census, the older population will be an even bigger percentage of the population than, than previously estimated. We, if we don't have older adults in our lives, we will have them in our professional lives. And so if you are interested in figuring out some topics related to aging for your courses, we can certainly work with you on that. Um, if you are doing any type of, of project and would like data on the older population in the, the Houston Harris County area, we can also work with you on that or, or let you know what's available. And um, we have been offering older adult focused service learning opportunities and we're hoping to expand that 
in the coming year. And then lastly, if you found this, this presentation to be useful, um, we can take it on the road. If you know of civic groups, church groups, um, any other groups on campus or off campus that you think would like a presentation like this, let us know and, and we're happy to work with them. It's time for our last poll question. How has today's webinar impacted you? All right, we had four people said that they're ready to tackle some tough conversations. Four people say, I didn't know much. I didn't know how much I didn't know about aging. One person said that they're more overwhelmed than ever. Oh, sorry. <laughs> and three people said they know about a program that can assist them if they need it. Okay. Well, for those of you who feel a little bit more ready, that's wonderful for the, the person that said you feel more overwhelmed. And that's completely understandable too. There's a lot that's out there. Yeah. Um, but just remember you're you're not in it by yourself and that um, Dr. Goins and I are yeah. here to help. And to that very honest person, please reach out to us so we can make it a little less overwhelming for you. That's understandable. We have time for, for questions if you all have any. Does anybody have any questions about any any of the material that we covered? And while we're waiting to see what questions you have, um, there will be a survey that goes out after the presentation and we really would like your feedback. Okay, I don't think we have any questions. So we're gonna go ahead and close. Thank you so much for joining our webinar this afternoon. Again, we hope that you learned a little bit more about some of those tough, tough conversations, but if you still have questions and you still find those conversations tough to have, please use us as a resource. Uh, we're here, uh, I'm definitely on campus. Uh, Ms. Mermelstein is also at a phone call away and an email away, Tammy, anything you'd like to add? No, just thank you for, for hanging in there and, and thank you for taking the, the time to, um, to to visit with us about these, these tough conversations. And, and please reach out to us both um, for any personal questions you have. And again, if, if you would like for us to work with you on adding aging topics or information to your courses, we're happy to help as well. Oh, uh, there's a question. Have you ever thought about showing the differences in aging for different ethnic backgrounds? Yes, we actually have. Um, we would love to do um, to do a presentation on that because we actually have some data, right, Tammy? We that do. Kinda, so yeah. one of the one of the projects CARE is working on right now is a, a baseline report of the status of older adults in Houston and Harris County, and um, we we have information. So, for example, um, in 2018, that was actually the first year that our older population was majority minority which um, definitely has an impact on the way that, that services need to be delivered and outreach needs to be done. And it, it, there's a change and people are starting to be more aware of that change. Um, it, it won't be in the report, but I also have information on um, the differences, let's say in, in intergenerational families among ethnic lines, um, basic demographics. So. So yes, please stay in contact with us. Maybe that's something that we can collaborate on. Oh, okay, there's something else. All right. Uh, uh, also for the, okay, would you please send me the information presented on the power of attorneys and how to get those done? Yes, we can, we can, we can send that to you. That's. Uh, Miss Allen, and uh, also for the gay community. 
yes, I think we do have data on LGBTQ as, as well. So there's, there's data that's available nationally. There is very little data that's available locally. Um, the only data that I have been able to find in the last five years was about five years old when I found it. Um, it was a study that uh, I think an MSW student did with Montrose Center participants years ago, but that is the only local information that exists, unfortunately. However, there has been here recently in the last couple of years, there has been some, um, some uh, housing resources that have uh, been developed here in town for the gay, uh, the LGBT community. Um, there's actually a, a new high rise they have that um, for older adults moving in, you know, more housing is definitely so it's it's getting better in Houston. <laughs> as far as resources for seniors, so for that. That's, a, that's the Law Harrington Center, and it is um, an affordable housing property that targets um, LGBT older adults. Um, you do not have to be part of the LGBT community to live there, but they make, uh, they make no bones about it that they are an LGBT friendly property. Yes. And um, uh, Alicia, if you could send us your uh, email, we can definitely try to get that information to you on the power of attorneys, how to get those done. Any other questions? These are great questions, thank you. Well, we appreciate your attention and time today and we hope you have a very nice um, rest of May and uh, we'll be signing. Which is, which is Older Americans Month, which is why we're doing this. Yes, so thank you very much for tuning in. We really appreciate your time and attention and, and hope that this was helpful to you. Oh, oh, could I get the power of, of attorney information too? So that's uh, Carlos Moore Perez. Okay. Well, Carlos, if you could send an email to uh, care at uhd.edu, we'll get that information out to you. Right. And if, if you want to talk, you know, what that process was like for me when I was my dad's power of attorney and all of that, I could maybe give you some insight into, you know, that I can't give you like legal advice. I'm not an attorney, but I, I certainly, you know, I, I had to use it for him quite often. And so if you if you ever want some insight into that, you you can contact me through CARE as well or through my regular email address um, in the social work program. I'm on the faculty website, so. All right, thank you, everybody. All right, thank y'all. Take care. Happy Older Adults Month. <laughs>